Even if your nutrients are perfect, one wrong pH swing or locked out root zone can wreck your whole grow. In this video, we're diving into how nutrients are absorbed, how to feed your plants at each stage, how to feed autoflower plants, and we're going to look at some mistakes that silently ruin your garden. So let's talk about how nutrients actually get into the plant and what can block them before they even make it to the roots. And you can't talk about this without talking about why pH really matters. Because this isn't just some little number on a pen. This is the key to whether your plants can absorb what you're giving them or if they can't. So here's what's going on beneath the surface of the soil. Many of the essential nutrients your plant needs, like calcium, magnesium, and potassium, carry a positive electrical charge. And that's why they're called cations. And your plant can't just absorb these nutrients directly from the soil or water. They're locked up until a trade happens. That's because the surfaces of the root cells are also electrically charged charged. And they don't just pull in whatever's nearby. Instead, the plant has to exchange something to absorb those positively charged nutrients. Usually, it trades hydrogen ions, which are super small and easy to release. The plant pushes them out into the root zone, and in return, it pulls in calcium, magnesium, or potassium from the surrounding area. Think of it sort of like a heady trade. I'll give you one hydrogen ion if you give me one magnesium. It's sort of like that. But here's the catch. If your pH is off, that exchange doesn't work right. When the pH gets too low or too acidic or too high, meaning too alkaline, it messes with the balance of available hydrogen ions and that makes it harder for the plant to make these trades. Even if all the right nutrients are present, your plant could still be starving because it literally can't access them. So if you've ever like looked in your garden and thought, but I'm feeding them, why are they still struggling? The answer might be in your pH, not your nutrients. And if you get the pH right, your plants can suddenly do what they're built to do. Absorb the nutrients, move them where they're needed, and grow really strong. So now that we've covered how pH affects nutrient uptake, let's talk about how much to feed and when. Because getting this right can mean the difference between healthy growth or constant problems. In veg, your plant is building its frame. Stems, leaves, roots. That's when it needs more nitrogen, along with a healthy balance of calcium and magnesium to support strong structure and new growth. In flower, your plant shifts focus. It stops growing tall and starts stacking buds. At this point, you want to decrease nitrogen and increase phosphorus and potassium potassium, especially between weeks three and six of bloom when the plant is building the bulk of its flowers. That's usually the peak demand window for P and K in most eight to 10 week cultivars. For longer flowering plants, this peak might shift a little later. And that's why many bloom boosters and PK formulas are built to like ramp up during that time. Because that's when the plant could really use that extra energy and support to build really dense flowers and pack on lots of resins. But now, how do we know how strong Wrong to feed our plants. You can follow a feeding schedule, but don't just go full strength because the chart says so. These charts are often written for large scale photo period plants, not small home grows. People typically use too much fertilizer. More is not better. Plants can only take up so much. Excess fertilizer builds up in the root zone and creates stress. Too high of an EC or like too much nutrients to your plant can cause all kinds of issues. Things like weak stems, very dark green leaves, nutrient lockout, or a harsh flavor after harvest. So here's a much safer rule. Use like quarter to half strength around week two or three once your seedlings are clearly growing. And then just ramp up slowly throughout veg. And finally hit your peak EC or PPMs around weeks three to six of flower. Then taper down near the end of flower to help the plant finish strong and avoid harsh tasting bud. Feeding the right amount is only part of the story, but the way you water, that can make a huge difference in how these nutrients actually get absorbed. If you don't water frequently enough and you let your medium completely dry out, salts can build up and concentrate in the root zone. That can lead to nutrient burn, pH swings, or even nutrient lockout. And on the flip side, if you overwater or flood your medium too often, roots can drown or rot, especially in soil. Either one of these extremes can cause stress, and stress plants don't grow well. So how often should you water and feed? That really depends on your medium, your plant size, and your environment. Cocoa and hydro need more frequent feedings because they have little to no nutrient buffer. Soil is more forgiving, but it still needs consistent moisture and nutrition. 
A good rule is to water when the top inch of your medium feels dry. And for cocoa or hydro, you might be watering once or even multiple times per day, depending on your setup. This is when many growers struggle, especially when trying to feed low amounts more frequently, which is really great for consistent uptake. And that's why I've started to use more and more automatic watering systems. I really love the auto watering. Right now I'm using the ebb and flow table, which probably, you know, this isn't something that everyone's gonna wanna put together and build in their house. I mean, if you do wanna make that and put it in your house, I made a video that shows you exactly how to do that. I'll leave a link in the description. And even though a flood and drain table in a really small tent isn't the most common thing you'll see, there are a lot of really great options for automatic watering. These can make your life a lot easier. They make feeding way more consistent and hassle-free, no stress. Plus they can help give your plant that perfect moisture zone to make sure the nutrient availability is always the best it could be. That means you're gonna get faster growth, you're gonna get stronger plants, you're gonna get bigger yields. Everything is gonna benefit from better watering techniques. And if you want something like this, there's two different types of things that I would recommend. First are drip irrigation kits. These deliver water and nutrients slowly and evenly right to the base of your plant on a timer. It's simple, it's reliable, and it scales really good if you're doing a lot of plants. These are really sick, I love these, and I've used these a ton of times in huge commercial grows, and we use them in these big grows because they work so well. You also have these self-watering bases or wicking reservoirs. These let your pot sit on top of a water-filled base, and the plant absorbs moisture as it's needed through capillary action. There's no timers, there's no pumps, there's nothing electronic and it's nearly impossible to overwater with these. They're super sick and it makes life a lot easier, especially those trays that you just set your pot on top of. That's the easiest thing in the world. You just fill it up and walk away. The plant just absorbs water as it needs it. And if you want to check all that stuff out, I left some links in the description and don't forget you can get a nice little discount with the discount code Strangeo. Dope. Because how much you feed does matter, but how often and how evenly you feed is really important too. Especially if you're growing growing in mediums like cocoa or hydro. And that becomes even more important with autoflowers because they don't grow on any regular growth schedule. They just do whatever the hell they want to do whenever they want to do it. So you can't just follow the regular week by week chart and hope for the best because it's not going to line up. So next, let's break down how to feed autoflowers properly and how to avoid some mistakes that can cost you your whole yield. So right now I'm running a tent full of autoflowers. I've got two papaya cookies in the front. They're looking and smelling really good. The gorilla cookie is stacking up like crazy. The double grape is getting really frosty and this forum stomper is already starting to smell insane. And I'm not that familiar when it comes to autoflowers, but these completely change everything when it comes to feeding. These don't follow the same schedule. Instead of vegging for six to eight weeks, most autos start flowering around week four, which means you've got a much shorter window to dial in your nutrition. Oh, and all these different genetics I'm using came from Seedsman. They carry top breeders from all over the world. They ship almost everywhere, and you can save 10% on your order with the code Strangeshow. Dope. So let's break down how we could adjust to feed for autoflowers. So in weeks one and two, just water, no nutrients at all. Then in week three, you can start light around like a quarter strength veg nutrients. And then through weeks four and five, as the plants stretch and show sex, you can bump it up to a half strength and begin shifting towards a bloom formula. And then week six and up, you just maintain your bloom nutrients, but taper them off near the end based on your plant's ripening schedule. You'll often see feeding charts based on a 10 week cycle, but if your strain finishes sooner or later, just adjust your timing. Don't just follow a chart, follow the plant. And with the autos, for me, it seems like less has often been more. When I tried to feed them full strength, they don't seem to like it. Quarter strength was fine, but they seem like they wanted a little bit more. So I've been running all of my nutrients around half strength of what is recommended for photo period plants. And that seems like a good rule of thumb through a lot of autoflower growers. Start with a quarter, maybe work your way up to half. But how do you spot when things go wrong? How do you know what's going wrong? This is what gets a lot of growers tripped up. It can be hard to spot and diagnose a lot of nutrient issues before they spiral out of control. So in this next video, I'll show you how to properly identify all of your nutrient issues and fix them before anything gets out of control. I'll show you what symptoms to watch for and how to fix things without guessing or making anything worse. So if you wanna protect your plants and avoid common mistakes and grow with confidence, this is the video for you. I'll see you there.